Gorgeous palace. Carpet. Flower petals are flying. Court ladies and gentlemen greet the guests, and the owners themselves stand at the door, expecting to show all the honors to their long-awaited visitors. A man with silver hair walked along the path, accompanying a young lady. The girl was wearing a small crown and a transparent veil. She was the first illegitimate duchess of their kingdom. The man told the girl that he thought it was really funny. The maid was peeking out from behind the tree. She came back because the girl tore her hem, but now it was invisible and still looked great. It was too hard for our heroine. It seemed to her that everything was about to collapse. She left her mother in that poor shack, and mentally turning to her family, she told her to wait for her, promising to pick her up. The girl walked up the steps to the palace, but mentally she continued to talk with her dearest one. The young man looked at the girl intently. She became very timid under his gaze. The guy gallantly gave her his hand. Her hair was dyed and grew back quite quickly. Now they looked silver along their entire length, and her blue eyes were very well set off by a chic blue dress. And her hands, from rough, calloused, and bony, became sleek and well-groomed, not understanding anything heavier than a flower. The girl from the ugly duckling she had been all her life became a well-groomed, chic lady with chiseled shoulders and eyes full of universal sadness. This story which is just beginning to unfold on these pages, will be full of lies and absurdity. A few months ago, before the events described, an unkempt teenager in patched short pants sat on the floor of a barn and smiled. And next to him walked a happy and well-fed pig. His sleepy head tilted to the side, finding support on the barn doorframe. The shovel for work was next to him. And in another place in another kingdom, silvery armor and a militantly fluttering cloak adorned a warrior knight. His straight, elongated sword was like one that embodies the faith of a knight. Hey! The teenager shuddered and woke up. Immediately grabbing a shovel to clean up the manure, the man carried cans of milk. He ordered that this milk be immediately brought to the kitchen. The teenager obediently left the shovel to take on a new task. The man urged him on and advised him not to linger. The child ran as fast as he could, hurrying to deliver freshly milked milk to the master's house. Count Romagnolo, with whom this boy lived and worked, was an aristocrat from a respected family. The Count's family was endowed with incredible talent. Due to this, they all excelled in literature, music, and martial arts for a long time. All of his ancestors were famous in the kingdom for their achievements, but in the era of the current Arato Romagnolo, a family crisis arose. It was known that his wife bore him four daughters in a row, but there was no eldest son who could inherit the knighthood. Therefore, the Duke was dissatisfied with his wife and family as a whole. He oppressed his wife for this, taking out his dissatisfaction on her. After all, a nobleman without an heir was not accepted in society. Only a boy can inherit a noble in high rank. The Count left somewhere late without saying a word to his wife. The woman guessed where he went, and she told herself that she would not rest until she gave the Count an heir. And two years later, after the birth of her youngest daughter, the Countess gave birth to the long-awaited heir. However, this event could not change the Count, who was so obsessed with women. The maid woke up the teenager at night. She told him to hurry up and get up and go into the closet. They were banging on the doors and banging with all their might. The child sat with his ears and eyes closed in the corner of the closet, among the few and shabby clothes. This is what his mother always told him to do when they started breaking in at night. When the boy opened his ears after a while, then he heard a man's voice scolding his mother with bad words. He said that when making love with him, she behaved very quietly and sluggishly. The teenager had experienced this more than once, being in the closet at night and I wondered whether this could be considered a physical relationship between a man and a woman. When the noise and crashing in the room died down, emboldened, he looked out the crack and saw a man with silver hair leaving. But the boy did not know who his mother's guest was, who periodically came to her only at night. And then everything happened according to a similar scenario. The child and mother ate meager food. His mother once said that his father was a wandering gypsy, but they never saw him again. But the woman always said that he was a very good person. A thin, small for his age and angular boy took a bite of bread from a whole piece. Hearing his mother's kind words about his father, he began to smile. The child was still quite fragile, but was often tired from everyday life, and he couldn't allow himself to miss his father, whom he had never even seen in person. The boy looked at his reflection in a puddle of water, but he knew for sure that that man had silver hair, and he used to have quite logical thoughts about this. Lost in thought once again, the boy got hit on the back. The man said that if he was lazy, he would be left without lunch. The frightened child assured that he would do everything right away. He began carrying hay to the pigs. One little pig pulled the boy's pants, and he patted the pig by the ear and promised to put his crib in place and asked him to wait a little. 
The sun stood high in the sky, bestowing its gentle rays on the leaves on the trees of the garden. A child born as the son of a maid. He understood that this castle was worth less than a tree in the ducal garden. The boy was unloading hay from a cart. He really could sometimes see the high-born and dazzling people who lived in this castle. But he couldn't even speak to any of them. But this did not sadden him. He believed that it was better to feed the animals. They were always happy and grateful to him for his daily affection and care. The teenager harnessed himself to a cart and was carrying hay. He wiped sweat from his forehead with his sleeve. A light breeze shook the treetops. Although it was hot, he told himself that this work was the easiest. Meanwhile, the master's son walked along the wall of the mansion. Out of boredom, he scratched the wall with his nails as he passed by. But when he saw the boy running through the grass, minding his own business, his gaze perked up. Hey, bug, he called out to the thin boy. He obediently stopped. Avio covered his nose and waved his hand, dispersing the fresh wind near his face. He said in a disgusted tone that the smell of garbage was unbearable. The boy made an excuse that he had just cleaned the pigsty. The master's son claimed that this place was very suitable for a bug. The thin man timidly agreed with him, but he began to accuse Avio of insolence. And getting angry, he kicked him in the stomach. The guy kicked the other guy with whatever he hit. At the same time, he was yelling something incoherent and meaningless. The boy thought with resentment. Since when did this start? It was strange for him to see such an attitude from the heirs of the castle. The duke's son was exhausted and left satisfied, and the boy remained lying on the grass without moving. And when the young master was out of sight, he stood up and told himself that it all ended well for him. And he clasped his hands and began to pray to the goddess Diana, thanking her for everything. The child asked the invisible goddess to continue to protect him, as she does today. He did not understand that life could be different from what was usual for him. Deep at night, when the lonely moon was already shining brightly in the sky, the boy writhed on his hard bed with abdominal pain. He endured it as best he could, but the sound still escaped from him. His worried mother asked him what could have happened to him. I was interested in where it hurts. The child's face was frowning in pain, and in the crotch area, blood was seeping through the pants. The child could not understand what was happening to him. He was afraid that after Avio's rough treatment of him this afternoon, his internal organs might be damaged. The mother was tearing out her hair, and she screamed, turning to the goddess Diana. Why is she so cruel to them? The woman plopped down on the pillow next to the child. He could not understand what happened to her. Why doesn't mom look like herself? The mother was crying and bursting into tears. She hugged her child, kneeling next to his bed and sobbing. She stuttered and hesitatingly said that the blood on his pants meant that she had become a girl. She always told the little one not to eat too much, and the kid claimed that he did not want to be in a place where there were men, and the mother also said that he needed to dye his hair. Those words were spoken to the child by the mother in secret, quite insinuatingly. The baby obediently agreed to all her ideas. Now the teenager's dreams of a shining silver night were forever shattered. After all, all his life he considered himself a boy, and as it turns out now, and in the manor's house, the duke is the only son he can use. He told him that he was completely useless and pulled him by the hair. His wife tried to calm him down, but it was in vain. But the Count looked down at the guy. He said that he could not believe that this vile man was his son. Then he attacked his wife. He accused her that it was all her fault, that even in books with a hundred-year history of the house of Romagnolo, there is no praise for any of their branches. The man continued to hit the guy on the head. He covered it with his hands as best he could. The wife tried to reason with the man. She argued that if he raised Avio correctly, he would definitely grow up to be the best son. But the man frowned in response. He asked if his wife thought his methods were wrong. She realized that the Count's anger would now fall on her. He claimed that all the heirs of the Romagnolo family always had silver hair. Therefore, he considered her a non-entity, that her children did not inherit his generic appearance traits. The man began to scream at the top of his lungs, and he hurried out of the room, slamming the door loudly. Their son continued to kneel hiding his head in his hands, and the countess fell to her knees, covering her face with her hands and began to sob, not embarrassed by the presence of her son. She couldn't understand why this happened. This was their long-awaited son. The guy was tearing out his hair and laughing nervously. But then, in addition, a girl burst into him. She saw her mother all in tears and rushed to console her. She asked her brother what it was, but he just shouted that he didn't know anything like crazy. The woman felt bad, and the girl sat her mother down on the sofa, opened the window for her, stood anxiously nearby, not knowing how else she could help her. Looking out the open window, the girl saw her and Avio's father getting into a carriage already drawn by a pair of white horses. She thought sadly, 
The chapel rested against the azure sky with the tip of a tower. The maid's child was still experiencing abdominal pain, but the feeling of hunger also made itself felt. She ate thin soup with a small amount of greens and cereals. The slurry reached out for spoonfuls of nasty mucus. Without thinking too much, she simply drank it straight from their bowls. After all, transportation work was already waiting for her. She still didn't feel well. So I told myself that I would finish quickly and then rest. But here again the vile master's son was already standing in the way. He called out, Hey Trash, your victim. The teenager shuddered nervously and began to pray to the goddess Diana, so that she would tell her how much longer she would have to endure to become happy. And the tormentor was already grinning in anticipation of reprisal against the unrequited victim. The duke looked at his son and asked what was wrong with him. He responded insolently to his father, asking who he took him for. The guy clenched his fists, trembling all over. He claimed that in the end the receiver would get everything in this castle, but a sharp thrust from a man's fist quickly sobered up the young man. And then Avio saw from the window the lonely figure of a fragile servant. It was on whom he always took out his anger and suffered the evil that he could not express to his father. He looked at the teenager through his hand, and he told himself that everything in this castle belongs to him alone. The teenager walked, bending over in pain. Avio called out as usual with one of his offensive variations of, Hey, trash! But she only shrank even more. The last two days weren't the best either but it happened that they might not see each other for weeks when she was outside the castle. Today, Avio had a new fun. He pointed a finger at the grass next to his feet. He said, crawl, ordering him to crawl between his legs. The teenager was already feeling very bad today, but still I had to kneel before the young master. He said that they should beg for his forgiveness. He ordered the maid's child to show how such trash as he himself behaved. The guy really wanted to dispel the effect of the Count's humiliation, the servant stood up on her hands and began to crawl between the young master's legs. Avio wondered why he was always silent, and I didn't know what to do, in order to somehow get the one whom I tried to humiliate every time into conversation. But as soon as the maid's child turned around, a blow from Mr. Avio's foot flew into his face. Blood sprayed from the servant's broken lip. The guy shouted why he was always silent. He said he was worse than a dog, that he's just an insect with no name. Blows rained down on different parts of the teenager's body. In the end, he just lay on the grass, covering his head with his hands. The young master left the lawn completely calmed and satisfied, and the maid's child lay on the grass for a long time, unable to even move from pain. As she lifted her calloused hands from her head, she wondered, what's wrong with them? Why were they unable to protect the head from beatings? And in general, how can one live like this? The woman wet the towel and placed it on the child's head. She had already been lying unconscious for two days in a row and the temperature kept rising. The mother took the child's hanging hand and kissed it. The moth that was flying next to the candle flame ran into the fire and burned. That's how her child's life could have burned out, and she made up her mind. After all, there was nothing worse for her than losing her, her daughter, that she hid it like that all her life from the master. The woman, plucking up her courage, knocked on the door. The count clenched his fists in anger. The maid opened the door with a creak and went inside. The owner said that her unauthorized appearance was a real rarity. He told her to come in. Her hands were shaking. The doors closed behind her with a slam. She asked him that she would do everything herself. She begged him not to touch his daughter. What will happen instead? She persuaded him to stop. But he did everything as he wanted. The girl saw a woman lying on the floor, and the doors of their room were open, and she couldn't understand what was happening to her. She said deliriously, Not Rioni. This guy was completely naked above her. He grinned evilly without unclenching his teeth, she couldn't understand what he was doing to her. After that night, the gray-haired man rarely visited her, and on the full moon she confessed to her mother what happened then. They shed many tears together. She understood perfectly well how the fate of an illegitimate child with the fate of a maid would turn out. Violence from an unknown aristocrat at a ball, and then childbirth. She was falling. Her stomach was beating. She was starving. The girl tried everything she could, but even exhausted and hungry, her child did not let go of the life inside herself. And one moonlit night in the barn on the hay for the cattle, she gave birth to Rayoni. Her mother then delivered the baby and washed the baby in a barrel of water. The woman asked her mother to say that a boy was born, but she just shook her head from side to side. That was all. After all, the gentleman so wanted the birth of a son, even from any woman. Therefore, to be born with a low status was her destiny. The woman quickly washed the floors, and when lunch hour finally arrived, she ran to her little room, where her little daughter was waiting for her, and she wanted to eat and a little affection. 
When she saw her mother, the little one smiled at her. She took her treasure in her arms and having fed it, lulled it to sleep. And when the baby grew up a little, at night the old mother helped her young daughter put her child to bed, wanting to get some rest that night. Grandma loved the baby, and she hugged the old woman by the neck and peacefully fell asleep until the morning. But one day my grandmother passed away. A woman and a child came to her grave near a lonely tree. Since then their lives have become more difficult. It started to rain, and the woman left, leaving the confused little one on his own. She decided to play the role of a mother uninterested in her own child. She decided to do this so that, if necessary, he could grow up without her. The baby followed her mother at a short distance, not lagging behind, but not catching up with her. It was impossible to allow her daughter to appear on the same day as her mother herself. The Count listened attentively to the maid, and he asked why, after many years, she decided to tell him everything. The woman asked to call a doctor for Rioni. She claimed that the child was sick and could die if he was left on his own for a long time without providing proper assistance. The Count reasoned that he had never heard of him before. He asked if he had silver hair. The maid nodded in response, but the man claimed that if there was someone like that in his castle, everyone would know about it. Then the maid admitted that she had been dyeing her hair since childhood for seventeen years. The Count clutched the handrail of the chair that he was sitting on, and he reasoned that this woman. But the maid interrupted him. She screamed that it was his child. He smiled and said, wonderful, in response to her. The Count told his wife about the unexpected news, and he said that he had the perfect plan. He couldn't believe he had a child out of wedlock, and it turned out that the maid was able to hide it from everyone for so many years. He smiled sarcastically and rubbed his beard. The Count promised the woman that he would invite doctors, and he stood up, making it clear that their conversation was over for today. Doctors quickly arrived to help the teenager. The woman was constantly on duty at the bedside, and the girl had a fever. After the specialist left, the child felt better. The temperature dropped. She stirred and opened her eyes. The mother, out of joy, squeezed the girl in her arms as tightly as she could. She was in seventh heaven. The girl was still very weak, she asked her mother intermittently, how and why the doctors ended up here. She answered crying that all three days that the game was sleeping, she remained nearby. The woman was happy that her child had finally woken up. But the girl understood that something was wrong here and repeated her question about the doctors. After all, only aristocrats could afford them. Oddly enough, the mother never answered her daughter's question, and it was definitely strange for her. The doctors had done their job, got dressed and were already saying goodbye to the woman, wishing the girl a speedy recovery. Only a week later, the girl was allowed to get out of bed on her own. The mother helped her daughter put on clean clothes. She claimed that now she could move on her own. But the girl was alarmed by the unusual and unexpected care and affection from her mother. Mother said that the stone was lifted from her heart. She told herself that she had never experienced a surge of maternal tenderness as it happened today. The woman clenched her hands into a fist with her fingers intertwined. The girl asked her mother, asked her to answer her at least something. The maid argued that she had to tell her daughter something, but she had the feeling that everything she said would strike terror into the girl. She tried to find the right words to somehow begin. She said that she knew so much about the Count that she hated him with all her soul, that the current head of the Romagnolo family was a wonderful and respected man in former times. But one day he became angry with a young woman and became indifferent to his work and family. Mrs. Romagnolo found the only solace amid all the pain, love for her son, and it looked like the Count was trying to find a woman who would accept his great love and enjoy his punishments. The woman telling this was caring for her daughter. Maylin Romagnolo was the only remaining fourth daughter of the Count family. Na was weak and irritable, always complaining like a little girl. Meanwhile, the mother put soap on her daughter's head to wash off the paint and wrapped her in a towel to dry. The woman said that Avio Romagnolo was also difficult. His selfishness manifested itself in early childhood. Therefore, absolutely everyone except the aristocrats were subjected to his cruel treatment. Many would prefer to meet him with a whip. The girl's head drooped, but she already had silver hair. Drops of water were still dripping from them. The woman folded her hands on her chest, as if for prayer. Words were difficult for her. She told her daughter with a heavy heart that she was the illegitimate child of the Count. The teenager narrowed her blue eyes with contempt. She couldn't believe that she had the same blood flowing in her as those people, and she would have been glad if it had all turned out to be a dream. The night sky was illuminated by stars. In the entire castle, only two lonely office windows were burning. The maid and her daughter, both with bowed heads, walked up the garden path, heading towards the large manor's house. The butler stood waiting for them with a candle in a candelabra. 
He made a discreet bow and led the guests to the door of the Count's office. The door creaked. A bright light shone on the couple from a crack in the room. The Count seemed simply huge to the girl. He looked down at her disdainfully. His fierce gaze frightened the fragile girl. She bowed to him reflexively. The girl saw him so huge, and the color of his hair. All this made him look like a snow-capped mountain peak in her eyes. He turned to the maid. He said that she told him the truth, that this is actually the blood of the Romagnolo family. The woman thought that she had given up human life, but she wanted at least her child to be able to live better than an animal. Her eyes were red from crying. The man was tormented by the need to make a deal, but it was not clear whether the illegitimate child was superior to the maid. He grabbed the girl by the face and pulled her towards him. The Count began to shout that this was some kind of absurdity, when the bastard inherited silver hair and blue eyes, taking over his blood. He continued to squeeze the girl's cheeks, examining her facial features. Then the man let go of the girl and was overcome by a hysterical fit of laughter. The girl was scared, but her mother held her by the shoulders and whispered to her daughter. When the Count calmed down, he asked the teenager whether he was a man. The child was again covered with a wave of panic fear. All he could do was mumble something and wave his head negatively. The man complained of boredom, and with a flourish he sat down on the sofa of the office. He informed the girl that as soon as he helps her, she should become Avio's servant. He said that he would still think about how to use it, and for today I considered what I had to be enough. He told them both to get out of his sight. Then for the first time the teenager felt anger, shame and rage at the same time but she was unable to wash away all traces of this man from her body and remove all his blood that runs through her veins. The girl was lying on the bed. There was something hissing around. It was a fire, but her body refused to obey her. The silhouette of a man looked at the growing fire. The girl called him for help, but when he turned around, it was Count Romagnolo, her father. She screamed, called for help, anyone to save her. Flakes fell on the bed very close to her body, promising painful burns to her skin. Jumping up and sitting up in bed, the girl woke up covered in cold sweat. She was catching her breath from the emotions she had experienced in her sleep. The mother also woke up from the noise her daughter made. She asked if she was okay. She replied that she just had a strange dream. From the day the girl had that nightmare, she was overcome by the fear that her whole life would be recolored, like the hair on her head. The shovel stuck into the ground with a crash. The girl wiped sweat from her forehead. Her daily life, filled only with emptiness, continued. The sow was sleeping and grunting in her sleep, the girl was carrying a bucket of clean water into the barn. She crouched next to the sleeping animal and placed her hand on its stomach. It became clear to her that she would not give birth any time soon, and the animal slept carefree, smacking its lips in its sleep. When the girl was laying out food at the feeder for the pigs, she thought that there was no difference between pigs and humans when it came to having children. She also noticed that in pigs, she had bad breath due to poor diet. The worker called the girl, Hey you. He said to always take this with you, pointing to her bowl. The girl took the dishes with the stew and went closer to the animals. She stroked the sow, who still continued to lie on her side, and promised her that she would come later. The cart rolled down the hill easily, and the teenager soon found herself in the Count's garden. She told the man that she had brought those fertilizers. He was just trimming the bushes. He assured that it was no longer necessary. He said they should be thrown away, because his wife gets angry when the garden smells like manure. And the girl had to return. She thought that if she had been told this earlier, she would not have had to drag it all so far. But before she was praised for fertilizing the garden, moreover, it was uphill to return. She was emptying buckets of manure. She told herself that it was difficult for her to understand the whims of aristocrats. And now she had a ruined lunch, or rather a complete lack of it. She heard pigeons cooing under the roof. Having unloaded the cart and feeling tired and thirsty, she saw a well under the wall. She quickly pulled out a bucket of water and doused her head with clean, cool water. Then she began to sniff her clothes to see if there was any smell left from the manure on them. But suddenly, approaching steps were heard from behind. Avio taunted the maid's child. He was surprised that even such a worm could wash its body. Then the guy asked who allowed him to arbitrarily dispose of the castle's property. He grabbed the teenager by the neck with all his strength. He asked for forgiveness, but this did not save him from the humiliating and painful blow of a sadistic child. The teenager lay tense, awaiting further reprisals from the master's son. The girl said that she would never use the well again. She did not lift her face from the ground. Avio blushed all over and clenched his fists. The teenager asked him to have mercy on her, but he said that the next time they beat him, he would never see his own mother alive. The guy was approaching. The girl was scared. Her hands sank into the ground, trying to hold on to it. She asked the gods for someone to save her. The guy's hand lay on her neck. 
but he only touched and stroked her. Then he checked her ears. He breathed with his mouth open on her. The girl was trembling all over. This breathing was similar to what she heard while in the closet, but Avio had to continue to think that she was a man. The guy finally said a few nasty things. Then he made threats and left. This was the first time there were no beatings. The girl stood and looked after the master's son leaving, and she couldn't understand what it was that just happened. She rubbed her neck. She couldn't shake the feeling that an insect was crawling on her, and it was just disgusting. The girl shook her hands off the ground. It turned out that if she bowed, she would not be hit. It was kind of petty, but it worked. She ran as fast as she could away from the master's house, and only there did I feel safe. The girl stood in a flowering meadow in a translucent dress. She was barefoot and exposed her face to the light gusts of wind, enjoying it. A guy in brown leather patent leather shoes and white stockings approached her. The girl walked towards him on tiptoes. She called him Aviosama and stretched out her hands to him. The guy shuddered and woke up. He sat in his bed recovering from his dream. His face was covered in sweat, and he clutched the blanket with his hands. This dream again haunted him. He could not understand who the girl was that he dreamed about so often. He remembered the incident during the day, and he told himself that he didn't want to do that to that teenager. The maid's child pulled the cart behind him again, and along the way I told myself how many horses and sheep she needed to check if everything was in place. Avio sat and was shaking. He knew that if the Count noticed this, his reputation would sink. He was afraid that his father might hate him for being too sensitive. The guy stood up to take a breath of fresh night air at the window. He reassured himself that he was the only heir to the Count, and in the end, the whole castle will belong to him alone. The guy said that it was already a great honor to be noticed by him personally. He looked out the open window, spreading the shutters to the sides with his hands, and he said that everything was fine, and that everything would be fine. The Countess placed her hand covered in rings on the table. She said that not mailing, whatever it costs. The Count himself did not understand why His Highness was doing this to their family. The invasion which targeted the kingdom's fertile soil, ended with the attackers retreating. Both sides suffered many casualties to bring things to an end, and the birth of a new war was not in the interests of each of them. Duke Lucas Murciani was the name of a hero who was famous for being a wise man and a brave warrior who fought on the front lines. He skillfully instilled confidence and courage in the people who followed him into battle. This was to such an extent that it seemed that only a complete victory would calm them down. A competent commander and orator, he was able to lead hundreds to victory. By gaining the trust of everyone around him, he became the king of war, the driving force. And so it was decided to present him with a daughter as an additional reward for his services. But the Duchess heard what the people were saying, that that hero was terribly ugly and enjoyed swimming in blood. In addition, he preferred raw meat. In reality, that person was a demon. The Duke said that he had no time for gossip and rumors, he agreed that marrying such a man was worth considering. He admitted that he couldn't stand the weak mailing. However, it was impossible not to agree to the proposal. The man claimed that the war hero does not appear at public events, and he doesn't show due respect to his family. The Duke knew that he was a daring young man. His hands trembled, holding a cup of tea. He was thinking about how best to proceed. Remembering the face of that teenager, an idea was born to him. The man thought that the solution might be right at hand. He called the butler and he asked him to go outside and pick up Rayoni's child. He bowed obediently, accepting the master's order. The duchess looked first at her husband, then at the teenager. I asked him who it was. She turned to the count, to make him open the window faster. The smell was simply unbearable, and the teenager did not understand why she was brought to the gentleman's house, and I felt a twinge of nausea from the porridge that I had recently eaten. The girl clutched the hem of her robe. She felt so unusual and uncomfortable being in a big house and even in the presence of these strange people. The Count told his wife to stop turning her nose up. He claimed that the child was clearly embarrassed by them. The lady repeatedly insisted to tell her who it was. The man, smiling, answered his wife that it was the child of the house of Romagnolo standing in front of them, adding that he is their mission. The wife asked the Count what this meant. He answered, turning his face away from everyone, that this was just his illegitimate child. The fan fell from the Countess's hands at this statement from her husband, and she thought that she had carefully checked all the women whom the Count had seized in the castle. It turned out that she had lost sight of one child. The Count saw his wife's excitement and dissatisfaction, but he absolutely calmly told her that she shouldn't worry so much. He picked up her fan from the floor. The wife was trembling and shaking all over, but the man assured her that it was possible to send this teenager to the Duke's family instead of mailing. The lady tried to answer him, stuttering from excess emotion. He asked her what she wanted to tell him. 
His gaze was stern. He passed the fan into her shaking hands. The countess knelt before him, bowing. She assured that she would do everything as he said. The teenager stood in front of the gentleman, and it turned out that she was half countess. The lady was assessing the girl. She understood that her daughter Malin had red hair like herself. The duke found out about this immediately, and it turned out that the maid's daughter had dyed hair. She skillfully deceived their eyes for seventeen years, and she seemed to know more about hair coloring than anyone else. And the couple decided to send this maid's daughter instead of their mailing, postpone the wedding for six months under some pretext, and hide mailing herself in the monastery. The count offered to observe, and at the right moment give her to a baronial house in a neighboring country. His wife said he couldn't do that. After all, apparently that girl worked as a servant for many years, and she may not be able to pretend to be an aristocrat in front of such a person. The duke took a rose flower from a vase. He assured his wife that one half was from the simpleton and the other from him. Therefore, I was confident in the success of their plan. He believed that in a few months he could turn a girl into a noble aristocrat, but then their reasoning was interrupted by a falling sound. They saw the subject of their conversation on the floor on his knees, face down. She asked the count to forgive her, that she is just a humble servant who cleans the pigsty, and she may not be able to pretend to be an aristocrat. And if they find out about this, they will be sentenced to death. The count approached the girl. He assured her that she could do it. He expressed confidence that she would cope with the task. The girl lifted her head from the floor and looked into his eyes. She asked how she could cope. The count squeezed a rose flower in his fist. He said that there is no daughter who does not take care of her mother. The girl thought with horror that this man would also destroy her mother. The duke clapped his hands. He asked the girl if she was going to change her life. And if so, then he suggested doing it right away. And first of all, he was going to ask the servants to thoroughly wash her body. Then he thought about it, and then he asked how uncomfortable it would be for him. What's the girl's name? But she lay kneeling with her face to the floor and did not answer him. The lady yelled at the teenager to answer the count's question. She demanded that she answer immediately. The girl began to stutter. But then she was able to squeeze out that she didn't know her name. The duchess expressed surprise that the girl is so ignorant that she can't even say her name. The girl scratched the floor with her nails. The lady continued her speech, that no matter how far she goes, it will remain vulgar, the count said in a softer voice, that in this case he will give her a name. From now on until the end of her life, she must live as a noble aristocrat. The girl remembered how she was called differently. Hey you, dwarf, scumbag, nothing. Although she didn't have a name, she hadn't felt uncomfortable in seventeen years. She thought that if she could take her mother, then she would have done a lot for both of them. The man spoke, raising a finger for emphasis. That Noritas Romagnolo is a wonderful name. The girl lifted her head from the floor. The count said it was nice to meet you, and he promised her that she would get to know her father better a little later. He said that her name meant nothing. The girl realized that for the count she was just livestock. The blade of the sword was wiped with a white napkin. A servant entered and informed the duke that a letter had arrived from Count Romagnolo. The man saw his reflection in the polished steel of the blade. On the table in front of him lay a scabbard for a weapon and a bottle of curare poison. There was chaos on the street. The woman was chasing a duck. The man was leading a horse. Another was carrying a barrel of beer. In the distance, servants were carrying baskets of laundry. The man clapped his hands and spoke cordially. That the duke, absent for so long due to the war, had finally returned. And tonight there will be a banquet to which aristocrats are invited. The servants told the butler that they understood his responsibility very well. And what he feels. They promised to work together to do their best. The guy was sorting out the mail. He was reading one of the letters from Count Romagnolo, that he asked to postpone Miss Mailing's wedding due to illness, and he asked what the gentleman would do in this case. The man replied that it would be easier if the Count died, and that's all. He looked at his reflection in the steel of the sword. The guy dropped a piece of paper on the floor. He asked the Duke not to say such terrible things. He claimed that for this very reason there were various but very strange rumors about him. People said that Lucas Merziani is a man like the night sky. And over time, the Duke's personality began to become overgrown with more and more unfounded rumors. His appearance was incomparable to demonic, because he was very handsome. But if the bodies of all the enemies he killed were collected, then this pile would be the height of a small mountain. The girl continued to sort out the letters. After all, there was not a day when the blood on his sword dried. However, he prayed to the goddess Diana. He asked her to be merciful to his sins. He asked to put to rest the souls of the people he had sent to the goddess. The duke's name was Lucas Merciani. He was a kind-hearted man who mourned the war and cared about people. 
the Chamberlain knew that because of these qualities, her master was quite popular among the ladies' society. The man asked Caesar to look up. He quickly walked up and slammed his hand against the wall next to his head. He said that because of those rumors he could not praise her. The guy stuttered and said that he regretted it. As a Chamberlain, he lacked the courage and was afraid to answer his master on the merits. The Duke stood at the window and thought about Count Romagnolo. The man was not at all against the youngest daughter of this snake-like man. But he understood that these were King Savior's intentions. It was he who needed this marriage union. The man looked at his reflection in the window glass. When he was a small child, his mother told him that neither his father nor his brother were alive. The woman told the boy that only he could stand up for the Murciani family. The child had tears in his eyes. And now he wrote with his finger on the foggy glass of the window, You are the only one. He knew he had to always be ready. After all, a new battle has already begun. The moon hung like a silver hoof in the night sky above the castle. The ladies were crying in the banquet hall, and the seasoned man asked where the duke himself was. His wife replied that she did not understand what was happening. The butler asked the maid if the master was coming, but she replied that she could not find him anywhere. The valet saw the duke get on his horse and gallop away. She scolded him after him for his already habitual rudeness. The guy in the window stretched, straightening his stiff joints. He tried to come up with a plausible excuse for the master for the butler and all the nobles. A girl dressed in an open dress stood in front of a huge mirror. True, she never wore dresses and did not know how to do so. That's why it kept stubbornly falling off her shoulder. She tried to spread her arms, but it was difficult. The dress was pulling. This was definitely not a time to look bad. She felt as if a curtain had been wrapped around her. Noritas wondered whether her mother would recognize her if she saw her in such a dress and hairstyle. There was a knock on her door. They said that the Count wanted to see her. The girl continued to stand in front of the mirror in the dressing room. She rustled the hem of her dress as she went to greet the guest. Avio came in, rubbing his eyes. He grabbed the girl's hand, recognizing her. He shouted at her why she was in the castle, and what kind of dress did she put on herself. And only now he realized that she was a girl, and she thought that she had met a man whom she did not want to see. And I couldn't help myself. The girl escaped his grip with all her strength. Then she curtsied and introduced herself by the name of Nuritas. Nuritas Romagnolo, she added with a pause. The guy had shock written all over his face. He asked himself why such a bug bears their name. The girl looked at him and then asked why he didn't understand this, and then only the guy saw the similarity between the blue eyes of his father and this girl. Avio began to nervously walk around the room and repeat how this was possible. He screamed at the whole room. What she wants to tell him is that he is related to her by the same blood. He demanded that she say something in response to him, calling her an insect. The girl lowered her eyes, abstracting herself from the hail of insults that rained down on her. A lady with a high, strictly dark hairstyle came to the girl. She told Noritas that she was pleased to meet her. The lady smilingly said that she was a mentor who had been entrusted with her upbringing. She said that the girl could call her Mrs. Bovaru. The girl answered briefly, okay, and squeezed the hem of her dress. The lady remarked out loud that it would be easier to teach an animal manners than to teach this girl. And at the same time, she narrowed her eyes angrily. The whip fell on his back. The lady told the girl to read it again. The girl's back was already striped during her training. Noritas clenched her fists furiously. She continued to read diligently, pausing slightly. The blows did not stop raining on her back. The girl asked herself whether those who work in the castle don't get used to the whip and hunger. After all, there was a time when farmers scolded her for being slow and often late. But that was the real reason, and Mrs. Bavaru's whip was absolutely merciless. But after the girl's pretense of being a countess began, something unexpected happened. The guy called his sister, cheerfully waving his hand at her. Avil stroked the horse's withers. Naruta said that they are timid animals. Therefore he advised not to make loud sounds in front of them. And it turned out that the guy volunteered to teach the girl horse riding. He lifted her onto the saddle and told her to carefully cross her leg. The girl in the long dress felt extremely uncomfortable riding the horse, so she tried to hold on to its mane. Naritas's face turned red. She was a little shy and still continued to be wary of the guy, despite the fact that he turned out to be her paternal half-brother. When she got on horseback, she took the reins in her hands and spurred the sides of the horse. He rushed off like a whirlwind, the lightness of the rider. Avio was taken aback by this turn. He asked the girl to stop the animal, because she did not yet know how to trot. The horse ran at full speed. Noritas shouted at her, Stop! She was firmly attached to the reins, not understanding their purpose. The girl pressed her whole body against the animal. When she lifted her head and looked forward, 
Then I saw in the distance the place where I had lived all my years of life. Afterwards, she caressed the horse in the stall. Today was the first time they spent time as real brother and little sister. The girl did not understand why she was considered the youngest, because she, like her brother, was each seventeen years old. She sincerely thanked the guy for his instructions. He brazenly asked what she could offer him in return. His hand was raised with a clenched fist. Then he touched her ear. And I wondered, why did such a low-born person have such delicate skin? The girl had a look of shock in her eyes. Avio mocked her again. Even then, he had played with her face and body before. Apparently, he is used to manipulating everyone. Whoever it was, lord, lady, or bastard, she clutched the hem of her dress in horror. At some points, she had no choice. Then she would hold her breath and count the seconds in her head. She could not understand why aristocrats commit crimes. Noritas asked the guy to stop, reminding her that if she gets hurt, it could disrupt the Count's plans. She asked Avoy to just stop. He shied away from the girl as if burned, and the excess of restrained emotions turned into trembling with clenched fists. The guy started shouting that he was not making fun of her, and having calmed down a little, he told her to come tomorrow at the same time. He turned sharply and stomped out of the stable, and the girl, left on her own, went out onto the veranda. The sun was setting. Several dozen pigs roamed freely in the meadow. The wind blew in her face and brought familiar smells. She thought how much things had changed in her life. Now she could eat to her fill. She lived as if she had caught luck by the tail. She was wearing an expensive dress, but just recently she was cleaning the pigs' manure and caressing their faces. And now, being in luxury, she missed the screams of pigs. The girl clenched her teeth in frustration and melancholy. But then Noritas heard footsteps behind her. She thought that these were aristocrats and that she might not get well. The man walked slowly, but against the background of the sunset, he saw a lonely, fragile female figure. Something was wrong with her. Getting closer, but not very close. The man wished good evening to the lady and bowed to her. She looked at him warily over her shoulder. The man clarified that this was probably their first meeting, and the girl thought that this was, in principle, her first conversation with a stranger. Noritas asked who he was, but then she stopped short, remembering the teacher's instructions. After all, it was not customary for aristocrats to talk to strangers. The man, having come to his senses, asked her for forgiveness. I pretended that his name was Lou, and he took off his hat in greeting. He said that he was on his way to the castle when he heard that there was work there, and it turned out that I got lost along the way. The girl looked intently at her new acquaintance. He really was no different from the men working in the castle, but something was wrong about him, and she was interested in solving this problem. The man argued that when someone introduces himself to you, it would be polite to say your own in response. The girl began to remember what was needed there. My name is May. She bowed in a curtsy. But then she thought that if she married the Duke, she would have to live like Mailing all her life until she died. And she decided that since she would never meet this person again, O could afford to introduce herself by her name at least once. She stood in front of the stranger and quietly grinned and said, Nuritas. He nodded his head slightly in response. He said that finding out the name of such a beautiful lady was real luck. And the man thought to himself that it was more like a pseudonym than the name of a noble daughter. He said that even though they were very close to the castle. But it was strange for him to see an aristocrat walking through a cattle pasture. The Count's youngest daughter was supposed to be 19 years old. But this girl looked at most 12 years old. He made the assumption that the girl could be a guest who was staying at the Count's house, but he thought that she was still too skinny. The man said out loud that apparently they had already hired a new pig pen cleaner. The girl confirmed that he was indeed a little late, and she continued to watch the animals. Blood rushed to the girl's face and she blushed. The wind blew in her face from the direction of the animals, and this didn't bother her at all. The man continued to be surprised. In front of him was the daughter of aristocrats who liked pigs. In any case, he was proud of being handsome. It was quite fresh there, and he was least interested in pigs here. Another gust of wind blew the hat off the man's head. The girl also tried to keep her headdress in place, but the wind also tried to lift the girl's dress. She asked what he saw and he claimed that only that his hat flew away. He clarified what else happened. The man gave up. He definitely saw that Nuritas was angry, and she was also worried. After all, the stranger definitely saw her undershirt, and she was very embarrassed. She had never experienced what shame was like before, but she definitely understood that he saw her naked body, and it was a maid who had recently been washing in the rain, but was now dressed like an aristocrat. It was completely absurd. The girl agreed with his words that he saw nothing more. She turned her back to the man. The girl turned to her new acquaintance over her shoulder, and she promised to pray that he would find a job. The man definitely didn't expect this. 
he looked with eyes full of amazement at this strange and incomprehensible aristocratic girl. He bowed and thanked Lady Naritas for her good wishes. The girl walked away, and the man was saying her name to himself, as strange and unusual as its bearer. She was already near the house when her new acquaintance shouted after her, See you again. We will definitely meet again. The whip once again fell on the girl's back. Mrs. Bovaru told the girl to deign to straighten her back and hold her fork properly. A lot of time has already passed since this ridiculous life of a girl began, and the teacher continued to whip Naritas for every mistake. Sometimes the girl thought, and if she were a real daughter, they would have been her as they are now. This would prove that the aristocracy is rotten through and through. The girl got up from the table. She turned to Mrs. Bovar, saying that she would soon become a duchess herself. And what if the duke sees so many wounds and bruises on her body? The girl had noticeable success. She understood that the whip method would cause the downfall of the aristocracy. And I decided to ask the teacher if she had been wearing expensive clothes since birth. She expressed fears that if the duke saw the marks of the whip, he would immediately understand that she was only posing as a noble girl. The girl decided to remind her that posing as an aristocrat is a crime. Both the imposter and his accomplices will be sentenced to death. The teacher was amazed that this girl decided to threaten her. She replied that she would have to wear old prison robes, that people on the streets will shout and throw stones at them. This will continue until they reach the guillotine in the main square in the city center. And if they can't avoid something, they will have to go through this path together. After that incident in the stable, Avio kept a respectful distance from the girl, but she did not believe that a person could change so easily, and she understood that sooner or later he would fall out on her. The girl spurred her horse and flew forward. The only entertainment in the world of aristocrats is horse riding. Nuritas had the feeling that, cutting through the air, she was rushing through the whole world. She let go of the reins, and her horse rushed like the wind. She offered her face. She wanted him to take away everything bad from her life. But she understood that her mother remained in the hands of the evil count. Nuritas, thinking about her mother, abruptly stopped the horse. He snorted displeasedly. She stroked his withers. I asked him to forgive me for slowing down so abruptly. She became sad and invited Avio to return home. The guy said that he would like her to forgive him for his past mistakes. The girl was drawing water from the well. She turned towards his voice and looked into his eyes for a long time. The guy's hands were shaking, and he looked down at the ground. The girl thought that this was a new way to mock her, but she was not ready to forgive all this, and the guy claimed that he mocked her because he was confused in his feelings. He wanted to say something else, but mumbled. The girl was already getting irritated. He yelled in her face that it was all because he loved her. It was an unexpected turn in the relationship. Avio demanded the girl to say how she felt about him. She thought that in the Count's house, it was considered normal to hurt someone you loved. But she couldn't understand at what point declarations of love became so annoying. She answered, I love you too, Avio-sama. The guy was dumbfounded. Then he grabbed the girl by the shoulders and asked her if she told him the truth. He was happy and said that he would ask his father not to send her to that demon duke. He said that he knew from the very beginning that she belonged to him, and now he will not allow anyone to take her away from him. Narita smiled back at him. She said that she loved him just as much as she loved the Count, his wife and mailing. Here the Count's son's eyes became bloodshot. It turned out that this girl was laughing at him and his feelings. He grabbed her by the dress forcefully and raised his hand with clenched fingers into a fist to strike. Said she was just dirty trash. Naritas realized with sadness that this new wound on her body would be deep. There was a dull sound. The hat was lying on the grass. The guy held his victim by the clothes. Her face was broken. She said that he shouldn't hit her. After all, in this case, you will have to take responsibility for this act of his. He asked her if she wasn't afraid of the power of the aristocrats. The girl claimed that she would still go to the duke instead of mailing, even if she died. She told Avio that this is how she is, and she asked if he found it somehow frightening. The moon shone in the night sky, sometimes hiding shyly behind the passing clouds. The little girl asked to stop. Her legs dragged limply along the ground. The guy's hand was pulling the child's braid. She said that it was already very late, and she mumbled something else. Her face was covered in tears. The guy threw the child against the cabinet, yelled at her to shut up. He said that all she had to do was be silent and endure, like she was an insect. The doors opened. The maid called my lady to dinner. The girl stood and looked out the window. She turned a little towards the maid and said that she was on her way. Naritas walked down the corridor, accompanied by a maid. The butler opened the doors for her. The table was already set in the dining room. The Count's family was already seated in full force. The girl politely wished them good evening. The Count looked gloomy. The girl asked for forgiveness for being late. The maid helped her sit down at the table. 
The Count and his wife and their children folded their hands in prayer. The head of the family said the words of prayer, addressing the goddess Diana. Noritas was sick of the false words of her father's prayer. She saw that the tables of the aristocrats were crowded with the number of delicious dishes, and no one could eat it all in one evening, and the leftovers and untouched dishes were thrown away, but she once dreamed of at least one piece of meat, and now steam was coming from her delicious food in the spoon. The girl thought that her mother would have empty porridge for dinner today. She lifted a spoonful of the fresh meat dish to her mouth. The sister asked the younger one why she wasn't eating. She was surprised that their food might not be to her taste. She mockingly claimed that since the girl was used to having dinner in a pigsty, therefore within the walls of the estate, a piece might not go down her throat. In this case, she allowed her to try eating with her hands. The countess asked her husband, is it obligatory to seat this girl at the same table with the count's family? Her daughter supported her. She said that she would be very happy to eat a piece of bread just in her room. She said that breakfast and lunch were already quite filling, and she argued that she probably could have skipped dinner. Noritas admitted to herself that the worst thing about pretending to be an aristocrat was the meals. The head of the family forcefully placed a glass of wine on the table. He asked not to force him to explain everything to them again, that it was all part of the training. He couldn't rely on Mrs. Bavara for everything. Therefore, I asked everyone to maintain their dignity. The Count ordered his daughters to have a tea party after dinner. He asked Mailing to be lenient towards her sister. After all, this is the first time she has encountered something like this, and Noritas was determined to learn everything from her sister. The maids entered the room. They carried flowers and carried a tea set with dishes on a special cart. The noble lady and the dressed-up fake sat opposite each other, but it didn't have to be this way. Neither a maid nor even a butler could sit in this chair. Noritas asked the maids, asking for tea, please. They answered that everything would be done right now. Mailing, resting her chin on her hand, said not to serve anything. She looked at the girl and defiantly asked who she thought she was, that she was just an illegitimate renegade. Narita said that if she quickly had tea with her, she would not have to see her again. Mailing asked if the impudent one meant what he was saying, but she answered her that she was simply fulfilling my lady's will. The girl said that since she was ordered to play an aristocrat, and they order her to drink tea, then she will drink it. Mailing was angry. She asked what kind of shamelessness this was. She ordered the maids to serve tea immediately. They all answered in unison that they were obeying her orders. Tea cups with saucers and gilded spoons were immediately placed on the table. The tea poured into the cups with a gurgling sound. Naritas poured a cup of hot drink into her mouth and swallowed it all at once, and she threw the cup carelessly onto the saucer with a clinking sound. The girl thanked her for the treat, contentedly wiping her mouth with the sleeve of her dress. The maids and mailing saw this savagery and opened their mouths in shock. Narita stood up and went to her room, lifting the hem of her dress. Mailing was furious. She screamed that this commoner was acting just like a child. Along the way, the girl thought that she would have to go to the devil instead of her sister Mailing. She frowned and wrinkled her nose. Count Romagnolo was sitting with a glass of wine in front of the fireplace in his office. Neritas was there too. She has spent the last five months studying etiquette and culture. And most importantly, she tried to get used to living like an aristocrat among other aristocrats. Her skills were still unrefined and rough, but gradually they got better. The man was sipping wine from a glass. The girl thought that after all, all the skills must have been in her blood, and she admitted to herself that she was already looking forward to this wedding. The book lay on the girl's lap. She was dressed in a luxurious dress and was learning to read. She looked up what her name meant in the dictionary, a group of dilapidated buildings. In one of them the door is slightly open. A soft warm light poured from it onto the path from the threshold, beckoning into the comfort of everyday life of ordinary people. From the middle of it came the sound of a whip. The woman asked her to forgive her. She was lying on the floor face down. Another furiously lashed her bare back with a whip. The countess stood over the peasant woman, trying to strike her again with another heartless blow. She accused her of seducing the count with her dirty body, and again the whip whistled and fell on the woman's back. And the two maids who accompanied the mistress stood under the slightly open door and were unwitting witnesses to the cruelty with which a living person was now being beaten. And the woman asked to punish only her. She begged the countess with tears, just not to offend and forgive her daughter. And again the whip was already in the air. The countess wondered if her disappointment would disappear if she broke the maid's chest. Her pregnancy with Avio was very difficult. Due to severe weakness, she was literally bedridden. Various doctors with medicines were fussing around her. And during childbirth, there was such heavy bleeding that the woman was on the verge of death for a long time. And only after 100 days of treatment, she was able to hold her child for the first time. 
but then the man she loved crushed another one under him. She remembered how young he swore his love for her until his last breath, how she was a little embarrassed by him, covering herself with her fan, and in the gazebo of the park, he proposed marriage to her, and she gave him her consent. And now she couldn't even imagine how many times he had seduced other women and cheated on her. She always reassured herself that she remained the only mother of his children, and so she silently endured such humiliation. But now this thin monster with blue count eyes and silver hair appeared. She screamed like crazy and furiously kicked the woman at whatever she hit, and only the tired one left that shabby and wretched servant's room. The sunset was beginning to turn the clouds in the sky scarlet. Noritas cautiously looked out the door. She thought that no one would know about her unauthorized walk if she returned before dinner. Her shoes clicked on the tiles of the garden path. The girl ran quickly to do what she had planned. She clutched a linen bag to herself. She put bread and dried fruits there ahead of time. She and her mother had never eaten anything like this before. The girl rushed like the wind to her dear mother. She knew that such bread remained fresh for a long time. She was sure that she must have liked him. Noritas walked up the hill out of breath. I saw my own house and chickens walked nearby. She stopped to catch her breath. But then she was alarmed that the door to the house was open. The girl realized that there was nothing special to steal from them. But still, they always locked the doors, if only against the cold and stray animals. She carefully looked in and called her mother. But what she saw inside horrified her. She threw the bag on the threshold and rushed to her mother. Her parent was lying on the bed with her eyes closed, moaning and coughing. There were bruises and dried blood on her face. The girl began to carefully wash her wounds with a napkin soaked in water. Her hands were shaking. She was afraid of hurting her mother. She herself shed bitter tears, afraid of losing her only soul. She could not understand what crime her mother could have committed. The girl rinsed and squeezed the water out of the cloth to continue treating the wounds. Her mother told her that all this was useless, and she doesn't have enough money to pay for her treatment. And even if you find money, none of the doctors will agree to treat the maid. Noritas probably knew who could have done this to her mother. She didn't even bother asking her, and she couldn't blame that woman. The girl held her mother's hand. She said everything to hell, and she cried hysterically, realizing that she could not help. She couldn't even protect her mother. She was given a name, but she had no significance, no need, no value, no ability to decide or plan anything. Noritas was sitting on the bed next to her mother. There were broken and scattered things on the floor, and traces of blood were visible. She understood that she was worth nothing in this world. Many carts with food were traveling through the gates to the castle. About a dozen men were unloading carts. Noritas looked out the window at the bustle below. She was surprised how much they brought from the Murciani family. Apparently, there was a tradition in the kingdom in which the groom sends gifts to the bride before the wedding. She stood at the open window, and she thought that she was really getting married soon, but it was just a replacement, and she's not supposed to want or feel anything. And she leaned her hands on the windowsill. That night, when her mother lay covered in blood, freezing, Noritas came to the count to beg him to call a doctor for her. Her father listened to her and went to meet her. Soon a specialist was already busy with the woman. He said that the patient could still be helped, and the Count held her mother's hand. But he promised to take care of her mother, only if the girl could enter the Murciani family. She then agreed, gritting her teeth. After all, she was left with no choice. After all, if she cannot play her role as expected, her mother's life could be cut short, and the Count gave her a very evasive promise. The girl closed the window with a latch. In this house, the gentleman did not know what it meant to be born poor. Noritas was no longer the same as six months ago. Her dream is to one day become a knight and to have a quiet life with her mother somewhere far away. Her dreams were buried in the hard, frozen ground forever. The girl saw in the reflection of the window glass how Avio burst into the room. He could barely move his feet and held on to nearby furniture, and in his hands was an unfinished bottle of wine. Noritas instinctively covered her stomach with her hands, but in a firm voice, she asked him how she could be useful to him. The guy had his hand on the door. He asked, nodding towards the window, if she had seen what was happening there. The girl was silent. The Duke's son began to get angry. He asked irritably if she liked the Duke's gifts, and does she really want to become a part of that man? Noritas realized that her brother had drunk more than one bottle of wine to bring himself to this state. He continued to say that once she said that she loved him and began to pull his hands towards her. A bottle of wine fell and spilled across the floor of the room. The guy started grabbing and hugging the girl. Noritas couldn't stand this. She felt like she was going to throw up. Avio licked her neck and decolleté area uncovered by her dress. At the same time, he spoke words of love to her. But it sounded so disgusting and vulgar that the girl would have preferred to hear words of hatred instead. 
She pulled his hands away from her, and she said that she was marrying the Duke for the well-being of her family. And she reminded him of the Count's words. The guy started to pound. He shouted that she was going to enter that house instead of her sister. He grabbed his head and started tearing his hair. He said that when she leaves, what will he have to do? Naritas could no longer look at this circus, so she preferred to watch the landscape through the window. This infuriated the guy. He yelled at her to look only at him. Avio ran away as unexpectedly as he appeared, slamming the door instead of saying goodbye. The girl told him after him that he was crazy. Naritas tugged at the cord with the bell, as she had become accustomed to for some time now. Soon the maid came in, creaking the door, ready for orders. The girl turned to Sophia with a request to prepare a bath for her. The maid answered her in a standard and polite manner, with words of humility to fulfill her mistress's request, and she began to undo the corset of the girl's dress. Soon Naritas was standing naked near the hot water bath. Her hair was dyed the same color as mailing. She stood at the mirror, covering herself with a towel and critically examining herself in the reflection. She used to be so thin that she looked like a board, and now her breasts have become rounder. The girl was sitting in the bathtub with steam coming out of it. She rubbed with force, almost scraping the body with the white linen. The maid told the lady that if she continued to rub so hard, there might be wounds. Naritas tried to wash away the traces of Avio's molestation. I wanted them to disappear forever. The maid pointed to a small podium and asked to stand there. Naritas, having previously selected the hem of her wedding dress, climbed onto a special platform. The girls began to take measurements of her waist and shoulder. They were very surprised that she was so slim, but at the same time, despite her thinness, her skin remained very elastic. The girls expressed delight at the mistress, gasping in different ways. The girl didn't know what to answer. This was the first time she had met such friendly maids. One maid complimented her fiery red hair, and she said that they seemed even brighter when she put on her wedding dress. Naritas was sad. She realized that the day was approaching when she would have to leave here and leave her mother alone. She was not sure that the Count would keep his promise to her, and she didn't know if she could do anything else. The maids whispered to each other. One told the other that she was interested in whether the bride was worried. She replied that she was probably worried. The third spoke as she sewed jewelry onto her dress. That despite the fact that the bride is very excited about the upcoming wedding. One look at such a beauty is enough to make you fall madly in love. Naritas thought to herself that if she were in the Countess's place, she would probably run away from excitement but she was just a replacement. She realized that she could not even move from the impending horror. It seemed to her that she would take a step and some terrible and deadly creature would appear from under the floor. But she told herself that she shouldn't cry so as not to stain her dresses, and she sniffled, holding back. The dress had the most sought-after patterns. Roses and graceful vines adorned the hem of her wedding dress. Lately, stars have often been in demand, so the bottom was lined with them. The girls demonstrated Naritas' veils of different styles, asking which one she likes best. The girl thought that she didn't see much difference in them, and she answered that any pattern would do. But she thought it would be great if they found such a long veil that would go down to the floor. This way she believed she could hide all the marks on her back from the beatings of the teacher and farmers. The maid said that it would be difficult to even imagine such a long veil, but it will be very unusual. The girls believed that noble people thought completely differently and they promised to find the most beautiful veil for Lady Naritas. Myling entered, and from a distance watched with envy as the maids fussed around her sister in her wedding dress. She shouted to them, Hey you! Paying attention to your appearance. All eyes of the four girls were turned to her. She ordered the maids to move, claiming that she has an affair with her sister. A true aristocrat walked in circles around Naritas, and she stood still, not knowing what to expect from her sister, who had never been distinguished by her kind-hearted attitude towards her. Mailing gritted her teeth and pressed her folded fan to her chin. She remembered that just recently, her sister was lying on the grass in torn and dirty clothes, receiving scoldings every time. And then Naritas was so skinny that no one even knew that she was a girl, and only fluffy clothes could give her at least some kind of figure. But if you look at the girl now, without knowing about her past, I would never have suspected her of being a simpleton. And one would think that she really was the daughter of the Romagnolo family. The Count, their father had the same blue eyes and snow-white skin, and this all infuriated the girl so much. She spoke, looking at her sister with envy, that this outfit on her looks like pearls on a pig. Naritas did not answer the boorish woman. Then she asked if her sister understood what her words meant. On second thought, she called the girl an ugly, illegitimate child. Naritas only recently learned to read children's books. Therefore, I did not understand the meaning of Mailing's words, 
but it was a mystery to her that she clearly wanted to verbally offend her. The full-fledged aristocrat spoke with her stepsister Akimbo that she had to wear this dress herself. It was strange for Naritas to hear that the girl was ready to exchange all her beauty for this one dress, and she was surprised that she still thought like a child. The girl started screaming at her sister, asking why she looks at her so contemptuously. She raised her hand and tore the stars from the hem of her dress. They fell to the floor, clanking on the tiles. Then the envious woman bent down, grabbed the dress by the edge of the hem, and pulled it with all her strength. Naritas remained standing on the podium in the dress her sister had ruined. Mailing shouted that beautiful things don't suit a girl at all. Narita smiled back at her. She thanked me for coming up with the most suitable style for her. She asked her sister to help her become a more worthy replacement for her, claiming that the Count would definitely like this. The envious woman was shocked. She couldn't even find an answer. She just turned around sharply and walked away, not satisfying her desire to upset her mudblood sister in some way. Narita stood in front of the mirror with clenched fists in her ruined wedding dress. It now looked more like the outfit of the Count's illegitimate daughter. The assistant stood near the Duke's desk with a catalog in his hands. The Duke sat with his eyes down at the table. The guy asked him what color his suit should be, blue or red. The Duke, without interest, answered briefly, yes, but in fact he did not answer since the question was an alternative one. The assistant offered to embroider ducal symbols. The man again answered meekly and inappropriately. Then the guy asked the gentleman to take the issue more seriously. But the answer was again, yes. Then he looked at the guy and suggested that if he went to the wedding naked, he would have to cancel everything. And he began to unbutton the buttons on his shirt. The assistant sighed heavily. He understood that the gentleman was opposed to the very idea of marrying anyone in general, and the daughter of Count Romagnolo in particular. After all, leaving his post, he continued to exert a huge influence on the king. The duke claimed that he had only come up with a good reason when he immediately realized that then, strange rumors about him would start spreading again. The assistant reminded the master that this marriage was being concluded by order of his highness. Therefore, he suggested that he try to do everything in the best possible way. It was reminiscent of the popular saying that the mind is in humility. The duke argued that these intelligent and humble people, when they went to bed, risked not waking up the next morning. And I understood that this is the world in which I was born. He said that the war was already over. The battlefields are empty but the real war took place in the homes of aristocrats, and it doesn't stop for a minute. And now their enemies simply do not show themselves. He was shocked, because those people told him unfathomable things about Nuritas. Remembering that the assistant was still standing waiting for his order, he asked him to send out invitation letters. The guy was yelling at the gentleman. He was surprised that there were such modest invitation envelopes for the wedding of the famous hero of the Merciani family. He asked me to tell him that this was such a cruel joke. The duke was absolutely calm. He replied that he was not going to expose himself to ridicule in front of people who did not care about him, and he preferred that his honorary chamberlain dealt with the rest. The guy left the gentleman's office, slamming the door behind him. He stood for some time with his head down. He understood that no matter how unwanted this marriage was, but he could not imagine that everything would turn out so bad. The assistant was holding a stack of mailing envelopes in his hand. He thought mailing was a poor thing, even though he didn't know her by sight. After all, the duke's heart remained on the battlefield. He wished with all his heart that his wife would turn out to be a kind woman, capable of melting the heart of this cold man. And he wished their future to be as warm as a spring day. He could only hope so. Now he was going to start creating a seating plan for the guests and preparing the ceremony in the groom's suit. Meanwhile, in the Romagnolo mansion, the intensity of passions continued to grow. The lady with the whip in her hand spoke to Nuritas, that her gait should be so light that it seems that she is walking on petals. She reminded her not to move until the duke approached her and lifted her veil. She asked him not to glare at the groom, but to lower his head in embarrassment. The girl would now like to know the news about her mother's health and whether she is eating well. She understood that it was terribly unpleasant for the Count's family to even meet eye contact with an illegitimate girl, that is, with her. The lady lashed with a whip, bringing the girl out of her reverie. Naritas replied that she was listening to everything carefully. Mrs. Bovaru had changed considerably since their studies began. Her strict hairstyle gave way to loose and skillfully styled curls, and she exchanged the clothes dress in dark colors for a style with a deep neckline. Naritas told her mentor not to worry, that she listened carefully to all her recommendations. The girl assured that she perfectly remembers the order of her actions. Stand against each other. Bow down. Greet guests. And that's it. The end of the ceremony. Suddenly the Count burst into their room. 
he saw that classes were going on, and he asked Madame Bovara how difficult the case was for her. Madame turned to him coquettishly. The man asked if his daughter was okay. She replied that his daughter was a fast learner, and she is glad to be her teacher. The Count extended his hand and asked Madame, does she have a minute to have tea with him? He assured that he had many questions about methods of raising children. Mrs. Bovaru began to blush. She replied that she was ready to keep him company until his interest was completely satisfied. The Duke replied that it was well said. They left the room together arm in arm. The Count licked Mrs. Bovara wherever he wanted. Now it became clear to the girl why Madame was dressed so openly, and it turned out that the Count was not ashamed even of his own child. She also understood that her mother was only a thing that could satisfy his momentary desire. Her mother protected her as best she could all her life. But now it's my daughter's turn. She had to go and tell her that she was leaving. Mom won't be around, but the girl promised to love her just the same. The Duchess told Mailing that she could not go to the wedding. She contradicted and begged as best she could, assuring her that she wants to take at least one look at the Duke, whom she almost married. The girl assured her mother that she would return home immediately after the ceremony was over. She said that she would not be able to rest until she saw that illegitimate girl burst into tears of fear right in front of that devil. Mother was against such an idea. She claimed that the Count would not forgive her for such liberty if he found out, but her daughter assured her that everything would be fine. She was going to pretend to be a maid. The Duchess suggested that they both pretend that this conversation had not happened at all. The girl was glad that her mother did not forbid her, but left everything at her own peril and risk. The mother felt sorry for her child, after all, she was destined to leave her home and go very far. God was already unfair to her. And then there's this vile servant with her degenerate. After all, how dare she give birth to a girl in the same year when their precious Avio was born? The Duchess ground her teeth in frustration. She would rather not know. The girl was worried and asked her mother if she was feeling well, looking into her eyes. The woman was holding her head, but she told her daughter that she was fine. She called her daughter various affectionate words, a bright child. The countess caressed her daughter's cheek with her hand. She said that it was not she and she who should shed these tears, that these tears are intended for completely different women.